welcome everyone to the Thrombosis Canada highlights from the American Society of Hematology annual meeting, a Canadian perspective. Uh, this is my, because I'm the first presenting, this is my disclosure, I'm Deborah Siegel. I'm a hematologist in Ottawa. These are my disclosures. I've received honoraria and paid to my research institute for um, some presentations for the manufacturers of anticoagulant drugs. And I'm joined by stellar faculty today from across the country. Um, we've brought you some of the highlights of the meeting that uh, we thought we would share that would be of interest to you. So uh, people will introduce themselves as we go. I'm required to uh, read these next couple of slides out. Uh, this is the disclosure of commercial support to let you know that this program has received support from Pfizer Alliance in the form of an unrestricted ed educational grant. I should mention that they um, did not have any role in the presentation uh, creation. Uh, so for our potential conflicts of interest, we are eligible for an honorarium from Thrombosis Canada, we speakers, and that Pfizer benefits from the sale of a product that may be discussed during this program. Uh, the content of the program was developed by the faculty and peer reviewed by Thrombosis Canada. The recommendations involving clinical medicine are based on evidence that is accepted within the profession and all scientific research referred to, reported or used in this program in support or justification of patient care recommendations conforms to the generally accepted standards. We also want to mention that this is an accredited activity, accredited by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, and the first um, of these to be accredited by Thrombosis Canada itself, so we're quite proud. We have a, a great agenda for you tonight. Um, we have four speakers, and we'll try to keep on schedule uh, so that we'll have adequate time for discussion at the end. Uh, so the program learning objectives are to discuss highlights of key thrombosis related and uh, hemostasis related presentations from the ASH meeting that was in December of 2022. And again, I'm Deb Siegel. I'm a hematologist in Ottawa. I practice thrombosis medicine and I'm a, a clinical researcher as well. My part of the presentation is going to be discussing two presentations from uh, the meeting and I picked these um, because they were of interest to me and some novel data. We want to review the impact of social determinants of health on the treatment of pulmonary embolism and mortality, uh, which is highly important and topical and an area where we really need uh, more research. And we're also going to discuss novel data about the association of uh, CRP and venous thromboembolism in patients with cancer who are treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. So I'm just going to uh, start out now, you know, by disclosure, this is a presentation that Mary Cushman gave. Mary Cushman is a hematologist and thrombosis expert in Vermont, and their study was to evaluate social determinants of in-hospital management and outcome of acute pulmonary embolism. I mean, these were insights from the nationwide inpatient sample. I thought this was actually a really interesting and important presentation. Um, and to keep in mind that, of course, this is a US-based study, but I think a lot of the take-home messages, and certainly it's extremely thought-provoking, not only for people in the US, but also for people in Canada, and really highlights to me an area of unmet need with regards to research about how we can do better for people um, from certain socioeconomic backgrounds. So it's important to start off this presentation by mentioning um, the discussion about race and race differences during this presentation. And in, in this presentation, the reference to race is, is done in the context of understanding the sociocultural determinants of health of the studied population. And it recognizes policies that have led to structural racism in the United States. And so although, again, we're talking about a US-based study, I think some of these things are quite translatable to Canada. Of course, in the US and other places, you know, in, in, in Canada as well, social determinants of health like race and ethnicity and socioeconomic status, we know are associated with many adverse health outcomes, including mortality. And in the United States, Black people have a twofold greater mortality from pulmonary embolism compared to other groups. And this is a persistent disparity. And little is really known about the relationship between so social determinants of health with treatment and a course of uh, and, and the course of acute pulmonary embolism or PE. So this study was designed to evaluate associations of social determinants of health with hospital management and fatality of people with PE who are hospitalized. And so they, they uh, use data from the nationwide inpatient sample, which is a 20% stratified sample of discharges from US hospitals, so quite a large data set. Um, and they looked at adults with um, PE hospitalizations, which were identified using um, ICD codes from administrative data sets. And high risk PE was defined as those associated with shock, cardiac arrest, vasopressor use, or ventilator use. 
Um, this, the social determinants of health that they studied were race and ethnicity. And, and I'll mention here too, that there are some differences in the way that these are captured in the US compared to other places. So we just have to keep that in mind as well. They looked at household income and they also looked at the type of primary payer, um, whether it was Medicare, Medicaid or private insurance. And again, in Canada, um, you know, perhaps this is something that uh, we, we think about as not being relevant to us, but more and more, I think we're, we're, rec we're recognizing that there are disparities in care. And in fact, there are different levels of care that are provided based on um, coverage. Uh, the use of advanced therapies in the study, there were things like systemic thrombolysis and catheter-directed therapy, surgical embolectomy and VA ECMO. Um, and then finally, they also looked at in-hospital mortality. So with regards to the population characteristics, um, and I'm going to use my mouse here, you can see that the hospitalization rate overall was 14.9 per 10,000 adults per year. But you can actually see that there was quite a variability depending on the race of the uh, individuals, um, with Asian being the lowest and Black being the highest at 20. On the right-hand side, you can see this diagram. It's a, I'll try to explain it um, so it's easy to follow. On the x-axis on the bottom, you can see here a different, a different characteristic. So we have age greater than 65 years, uh, female or biological sex, income, uh, and Medicaid, which is uh, uh, publicly funded healthcare, and then uh, residents like urban or rural. And you can see that there were you know, different characteristics. They looked at the percentage um, that were different with using white people as a reference. Um, and so uh, interesting to note that there was some variability across depending on racial background. I think one of the important findings here um, was that they looked at the odds of patients having a high risk PE according to race, again, using white, white race as a reference. And you can see that individuals who had Asian or Pacific Islander background, Hispanic or black or other, um, were, had, were associated with an increased odds of having a high risk PE compared to white people. And these analyses were adjusted for other covariates like primary diagnosis, age, sex, income, et cetera. In this slide, they showed that the use of advanced therapies. So, you know, the use of advanced therapies, so like we talked about systemic thrombolysis, catheter-directed treatments, et cetera, was actually rather low. So 5.5% of hospitalizations uh, for acute PE, and then 19% of those uh, for high-risk PE, which makes sense. You're going to reserve these therapies for the people who are at most high risk, right? But what is interesting here on this slide is that they showed that the adjusted odds ratio for the use of advanced therapies was lower in people who in people who are Black, Asian, or Pacific Islander compared to white people. Uh, also, people who had a Medicare or Medicaid insurance compared to private insurance, um, and that so. I think those are actually very uh, compelling findings. These are also adjusted for other baseline covariates like age and sex and PE status, et cetera. You can see they're on the bottom of the screen. This slide shows the adjusted odds ratio for in-hospital mortality in people who are hospitalized with PE. So on the right-hand side, you can see here that the overall death rate was six, around 6%, but high-risk PE, the death rate was 50%. So that's actually was, was quite a, a difference. And you can see that certainly there was an impact of race on um, adjusted odds of dying in hospital. Um, and so you can see that compared to white people, uh, there was an increased risk of death um, in Blacks, in Hispanics, and in Asian or Pacific Islanders, um, and also in those who had uh, uh, income, who had lower income. So in summary, they showed here, you know, that really the outcomes after PE really differed according to racial background. And then in fact, black people have a disproportionate burden of hospitalized PE. And there were some other factors that um, they had found. So this was independent of other factors. Um, they found that advanced therapies were not often used. We, show, we saw that, but that um, blacks, Asians and government insured people, so publicly funded uh, healthcare were less likely to receive advanced therapies, which is actually a really interesting finding. They also found that black, Asian and Hispanic people with high risk PE were 11 to 50% more likely than white people to die in hospital. And then among all PEs, Hispanic and Asian people and those with low income were more likely to die in hospital. So we're overall here seeing that there is a, a difference in outcomes and clearly um, the outcomes were worse among certain racial groups and a low income status. So there are some limitations, of course, they use administrative data, which is retrospective, and, and obviously uh, there are some limitations associated with that. Um, you know, we didn't consider, of course, here all of the measures of, 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 of social determinants of health. Some were not available, like education. 
Um, and so, and they considered here advanced therapies were like quality indicators here, but they're not always better. And there are different reasons that, that they're used in some settings. But I think, you know, in conclusion for this, and the reason why I wanted to present this today is that I think we're really just at the beginning of understanding and identifying um, health disparities based on social determinants of health. And we really need to do a better job of this for our patients. And so this, this study to me was sort of a call uh, to action for us, um, in not only in the US and Canada. We don't really know um, why uh, these things exist, but certainly awareness, uh, trust in the system, misdiagnosis of symptoms, structural racism, um, unconscious bias, and other issues uh, clearly are involved. Um, and so, you know, more research is needed in this space. So that's, that's uh, the first presentation that I wanted to share with you. And also, I think that, you know, this is an opportunity for us to reflect on our own patients and, and to be mindful of patients' social status and their social context in, in how we treat them. And, uh, and, you know, and, inter and that maybe that's something that we should consider more when we're uh, managing patients in the clinic. The second presentation to switch gears is really very different. So we'll take a breath and it's nice that there's a bit of a bit different background to just, you know, switch our, our, our gaze over to something quite different. Um, for the second presentation, I thought this actually presentation got quite a bit of attention at the oral presentation session. And this was a presentation um, by Dr. Moak and colleagues, uh, who's from Vienna, early dynamics of CRP predict the risk of venous thromboembolism in patients with cancer uh, treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, and so there is a lot of interest in understanding venous thromboembolism uh, among patients who are treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. These are obviously increasingly used and high rates of VTE have been observed in clinical practice, but in fact, the prothrombotic effect of these treatments are not very clear. Um, you know, the known, our known uh, risk prediction models, of course, weren't developed and, and validated uh, among patients who were on these treatments. And so apparently uh, the, the models for cancer-associated VTE actually don't perform very well in the setting of these. So this study really aimed to explore um, the early dynamics of CRP levels after the initiation of immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, to predict VTE. So they looked at CRP uh, among, uh, these, among treated patients. And so we know that immune checkpoint inhibitors induce a systemic inflammatory response that both has an anti-tumoral immune response, but also leads to immune-related adverse effects. And I think we're likely all familiar with some of those and have seen patients, um, you know, experience both of those effects. The early CRP elevation has been reported after the initiation of therapy. And in fact, CRP is associated with both mortality and treatment response. And so um, research has shown that a higher baseline CRP sorry, is associated with poor outcomes and that early CRP dynamics, so whether it goes up or down and how it, how it changes may actually be a potential biomarker for treatment response. So in this study, there was a retrospective a study of 400 patients uh, treated with cancer in Vienna, who, treated with, can with cancer treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors in Vienna, uh, and they were followed for the duration of their treatment. Um, the endpoints of the study were venous thromboembolism, and you can see uh, a variety of VTE events listed there. Uh, they measured CRP at baseline, which was here defined as uh, within four weeks of, of uh, starting the ICI. Sorry, I have a twitchy finger. Um, and they did some longitudinal measurements uh, within the first three months. And then the CRP dynamics, I'll show you this in another slide, but they defined the CRP flare, so CRP that increased um, over uh, 2.5 fold. And they defined a CRP response as a 50% relative decrease in CRP, and those were from baseline. And they used a competing risk analysis, which was, which was a really good thing. So the, again, the study cohort was 400 people. Um, they were followed for an average of eight months. You can see here on the, on the right-hand side, they were you know, around 65 years of age, 40% were female. The most common tumor types were melanoma and non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, and 90% of the people had stage four disease. The most commonly used uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors were pembrolizumab and nivolumab. So here's where we look at the CRP dynamics. And so remember, we, I just described that they defined a CRP um, flare as an increase in CRP more than twofold above baseline. So that's this red line here. Um, and they defined a CRP response as a decrease in CRP below baseline of 50%. So that CRP response here. Um, and you can see that, you know, in this, in this cohort, uh, almost 80% of people had this CRP flare, which is the increase here, 2.5 fold increase, a CRP response was 30% of people. And then there were some other responses, which we'll, we'll go into in a bit. But really they wanted to look at the risk of VTE 
uh, according to the CRP dynamics. I'm not sure why that's going automatically. Um, and uh, we can see here for the CRP flare, sorry. Um, we can see here that the highest risk of VTE uh, was among patients who had that CRP flare here in red uh, at 17.5%. Among people who had a CRP flare and then their CRP dropped, who those people are the flare responders, their risk was about 6, 17% as well. But the lowest risk here was this uh, response without flare. So those people in the blue line whose levels just dropped below 50%, they had the lowest risk of VTE. And this slide shows the cumulative VTE risk according to the early CRP flare. So you can see in red here that the early CRP flare and the risk of VTE was much higher among people with the early CRP, early CRP flare compared to no early CRP flare. And that um, hazard ratio is about uh, 3.6. So a fourfold increase in VTE for patients who had that early CRP flare. Uh, this slide shows the association of VTE with mortality according to CRP flare. And you can see here on the right-hand column, the hazard ratio for death after VTE was highest among people with a CRP flare, and that's in the top row. Um, and a flare without response, that's in the second row or highlighted in pink. And then um, in the flare responder. So we're looking at two to three-fold increase in risk of death after VTE among people who had that CRP uh, flare. So in conclusion, the early dynamics of CRP levels are associated with the risk of VTE during immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy, and that the highest risk is observed in these patients who have that early CIP, the CRP flare after the ICI initiation. The lowest VTE risk patients were the people who had that CRP drop below 50% with no prior flare. So really it does look like there's a potential link between the um, immune checkpoint inhibitor induced systemic inflammatory response and the risk of VTE. And actually this makes sense. We know that inflammation increases the risk of thrombosis. Um, and uh, so I'm going to um, end here with this slide, just to say that you know findings of an association of VTE with mortality um, with the CRP flare, you know, makes us wonder about the future where we can use this biomarker to predict uh, who may be, you know, uh, at risk, higher risk of getting VTE and who may be candidates for, for example, a prophylactic anticoagulation. Now that's down the line in the future and, and you know, validation of these results would be needed in prospective study, but it's actually these, I found these results um, quite compelling. So with that, I'll hand it off to my colleague, Dr. Skeeth, who is going to present um, next and uh, I'm passing over the mic now. Excellent, Th thank you very much. Request control. All right, I'm, I'm Leslie Skink, one of the hematologists and thrombosis specialists in Calgary, and I'll be presenting in with slides that are shared with permission from Dr. Kovacs from London, Ontario, and Dr. or Professor Middeldorf from uh, the Netherlands. Here are my disclosures. So I'll focus on two abstracts, the catheter three study and a life two which was a, a, a late breaking. So background for our first abstract for catheter three, we know that upper extremity DVT is, is common. It is four to 10% of, of DVT with different causes, including cancer and line placement. And surprisingly, we still don't know what the optimal anticoagulant is for a cancer and line associated upper extremity DVT. In the same research group, a Canadian, um, our thrombosis colleagues published catheter one, which looked at dolciparin bridge to warfarin. And the focus of this first prospective cohort study was, was line uh, and line failure. And it showed that no lines had to be removed because of an infusion failure or recurrent DVT which really gave us evidence that we can keep the line in place and we don't have to be removing the line for, for treatment. And reassuringly, there were no VTE recurrences with three major bleeds, including one bleeding-related re death. 
but with more information with, with the DOAX, catheter two uh, followed uh, several years later. They also showed no lines needed to be removed for infusion failure or recurrent DVT, but there was more of a safety signal in a small 70 patient prospective cohort study for standard dose uh, rivaroxaban, where there was a signal towards excess major and clinically relevant non-major bleeding, 10% major bleeding. Of the 70 patients, there were seven major bleeds and four clinically relevant non-major bleeds, all five uh, gynecological, four GI and two GU. So kind of that, that um, possible safety signal with rivaroxaban and really happened in that first 39 days. And there was one death per PE. So it did open the question on, on what that optimal management is in the era of DOAX. So I'll present uh, the catheter three study and, and thank you to Mike Kovacs for, uh, for the slides. This is a multi-center prospective cohort study of 70 patients with active malignancy who had symptomatic proximal upper extremity DVT uh, with or without PE associated with a, a, a line. Because of that concern for that early bleeding risk, the decision was made to do the first seven days with low molecular weight heparin, followed by a Pixaban five milligrams twice a day uh, for, for the total of the three months. And patients were followed clinically at one week, four weeks, and 12 weeks to assess for outcomes. The primary outcome was catheter survival at three months. Loss included infusion failure that did not respond to TPA and physical removal of the line with important secondary outcomes of symptomatic recurrent VTE, uh, major bleeding, clinically relevant non-major bleeding as defined by ISTH criteria, and, and death from all cause. Sorry, I just saw a note from Deb. I don't know if there's anything else I need to do. It's been sorry. Let, no, it's okay. Right. Yep. Okay. Sorry. I just saw a little note and all events were independently adjudicated. Of the patient demographics of the 70 patients, the median age was 62. The main vein involvement was axillary and subclavian, and the, the number one line type was a PIC line of 80% of the cases. And I think the cancer type is important when we are trying to evaluate bleeding risk with other cancer and, and DOEX studies, and 31% were of breast cancer patients, which is similar to catheter two, and you can see more of a breakdown for colon cancer, colorectal cancer. There is some um, uh, uh, of, of this group as well. And there, so the primary out outcome, the catheter survival at 12 weeks was, was 57%, but you can see that, that um, the mean line survival time, 65 days, and that mainly they, they came out because of end of therapeutic need, fell out, inf infection, death. So not because of uh, catheter failure or recurrent DVT. For important secondary outcomes, there was one DVT in the same arm of a patient at day 10 who had breast cancer. The line was, was not removed and there were two, two deaths thought to be unre unrelated. And we really are focusing in comparison to catheter two for bleeding. There were six bleeding events, sorry, that just say in six patients, two major bleeding and four clinically relevant non-major bleeding, all within the first 56 days of treatment, maybe not so much of that big, big signal um, where it was two, GI one one G GU you can you can see the different types of bleeding just to get a sense that probably a little bit lower than the catheter two study, but there are limitations. This is open label. They knew what they were were getting. A decision to go into the study, single arm, 
these were eight outpatients, so not acutely ill in, in hospital who may have issues with low blood counts or chemotherapy and follow-up duration is, is limited. And, and it is a small study, but hopefully helpful information when deciding on, on those challenging cases, especially in those with concern for bleeding risk. So the study con conclusions of Pixaban shows promise in treating CVC-associated upper extremity DVT in cancer patients, resulting in preserved line function. The observed bleeding rates were less than the study with rivaroxaban, but both studies are small. And in a total of 214 patients, I, I think that same message holds true. We do not need to remove the line unless they need, it needs to come out for other reasons but further study is still recommended. So switching gears towards uh, also a bit of a change to a life too. Uh, and I have the, the pleasure, pleasure and privilege to, to present this from uh, uh, Dr. Middledorp, Professor Middledorp. So the background for a life too is, and we're talking more about pregnancy loss now rather than thrombosis. There's no difference in live birth rates in a general population with recurrent miscarriages when investigating low molecular weight heparin versus placebo or, or versus aspirin versus placebo. But we do know that there is a small increased risk of pregnancy loss in patients with inherited thrombophilia like factor V Leiden. There's been several case control studies, which showed this signal, and then follow-up cohort studies, which still, still show a small increased risk of, of pregnancy loss. But our big question is, do, you know, can we treat or do anything about lowering that chance of pregnancy loss? Is it a problem with the blood, blood clotting and the placenta? In a meta-analysis of eight randomized trials, we looked at, uh, in this um, group and population, we looked at the subgroup of patients with inherited thrombophilia, and there was no added benefit of low molecular weight heparin, but the confidence intervals were wide. There was still this, and there's still this unanswered question where a definitive trial is needed. A life two, was over 41 centers in five countries with, um, and it was op open label, patients with a history of two or more early, or sorry, two or more miscarriages recruited in the first trimester early within uh, seven weeks gestation were randomized to low, prophylactic dose low molecular weight heparin plus standard pregnancy care versus standard pregnancy care alone uh, with a known thrombophilia. The primary outcome was live birth rate. And it was practical, pragmatic, that it could have been any or, or different types of low molecular weight heparin listed here. So our standard dosing. Here are the sample size assumptions. The, there are um, estimated 324 randomized eligible women with a live birth rate in the control arm of 55 percent and and in the results the live birth rate is higher than this the absolute difference of 15 percent in the live birth rate and here's our the flow diagram 162 and 158 analyzed in the intention to treat uh, population the mean age you can see is similar number of miscarriages of three or more are, are similar and the majority were the mild thrombophilias, factor V Leiden, prothrombin gene mutation. And you can see the, the breakdown here of the, the less common thrombophilias. And our primary outcome, I think really Im importantly, was that there was no difference in live birth rate between low molecular weight heparin and the standard of care arm with an odds ratio or an adjusted odds ratio of 1.08 adjusted for age, number of miscarriages center and randomizing country. And uh, we also have a uh, helpful subgroup analysis. There's no major signals 
uh, in any of the, the subgroups presented uh, he, here today or at ASH. So this is a, the first RCT dedicated to women with recurrent miscarriage and inherited thrombophilia. Previously, it was really trying to gather information from subgroups. It was a careful documentation of efficacy, adverse uh, events, which, which is what you would expect with low market heparin. I did not present those, those results today with an intention to treat and low rate of loss to follow up. It was pragmatic, multi, multi-center. The downside is that it's open label there is crossover to there were was crossover to low molecular weight heparin and so, and the sample size with modest so they could not exclude 10% absolute difference in live birth rate in either direction so in pregnant women with inherited thrombophilia and recurrent miscarriage the live birth rate is approximately nine, sorry, approximately 70% with standard pregnancy care and low market heparin did not increase the live birth rate. And to me, this closes the book. We've had several studies and more and more data showing that we do not need to treat with low molecular rate heparin to prevent miscarriage in those with inherited thrombophilia, different scenario for antiphospholipid syndrome. And because of that, we do not need to test for inherited thrombophilia for this in indication. In the absence of any benefit, we, we um, do not need to test or treat with low market heparin. So very exciting to see this uh, published. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Sina. I will really stop the control. And I think I might have control now. So let me see if this works. So just to introduce myself, um, I'm Runa Sinha. I'm a pediatric hematologist um, from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And um, I guess I'll also, in my disclosures, I have that I'm the current HCDC president as well. And I'm really here to bring some of the hemostasis aside. Um, I recognize that most of the people here would not be pediatric practitioners. So I did try to find some topics that were relevant to both pediatric and adult readers. And I also wanted to thank um, all of the people whose work I'm actually presenting. Um, so all of the people who presented at ASH and especially to the authors of the um, papers that I will be going through. So the first topic that I'll be talking about is a little bit of engineered biomaterials for hemostasis. And this was really around looking at what are some of the clinically relevant things that are coming through the research stream. So first of all, um, the, there's still a recognized need um, in uncontrolled bleeding. So trauma is still the leading cause of death for people under 40. It's the highest cause of potential life lost. Um, there's a higher risk in people with um, bleeding disorders or blood thinners, um, and that blood components uh, rely on donors. And also that there's, especially with COVID and things like that, we've seen a lot of shortages on the system as well. And then components like platelets are especially hard or near impossible to get in a lot of the regions that I serve, for example, in rural Saskatchewan. So um, the anatomy of a platelet-like particle has several different parts to it. So there's the, um, the, uh, the uh, protofibrils on the surface um, and then the, um, the deformable um, microgel on the inside. And what's really, um, what was really interesting about um, the platelet-like particles is that these synthetic platelets are really at a point now that they're better able to really um, uh, emulate what a platelet is like. So they have a higher degree of uh, deformability now. Um, and what they've been working on is really to get that higher fibrin affinity as well. So, um, so this makes it act more like um, activated platelets in real life. Um, they've done a lot of work with regards to fibrin targeting, and there's really just a 0.9% difference between fibrin and soluble fibrinogen. And so getting that target right and um, making sure that, that you're able to target the actual fibrin has been something that's come a long way in the last few years. And then the fibrin, of course, will promote the clotting um, and the rest of the clotting cascade. 
The platelet-like particles um, are then able to induce microscopic and macroscopic clock collapse, um, while the less deformable particles and non-fibrin binding deformable particles do not. So this clot retraction part is a really important part of the um, of how we create that clot. Um, and so we can see here that because there's clot retraction that we're seeing, there's increasing in the clot stiffness um, using these platelet-like particles, and that the size goes down. And this actually is part of what stimulates the cell migration into the retracted clot. And the cell migration is really what helps with the proliferation um, and the ultimate healing and remodeling that needs to occur within that clot. So with these platelet-like particles, um, they have done um, some mouse studies um, where you have IV administration of the platelet-like particles, um, you have them in circulation, um, and then um, the injury is given to the animal, and then there's organ collection afterwards. And with this, they've seen that the actual um, changes that they've seen um, with the delivery of the platelet-like particles um, produce a um, wound area that is much um, improved compared to if it's just with saline or um, even with murine platelets. And they've done this um, in pig studies as well, a um, similar mechanism. And what you can really see that's quite interesting is at the bottom, you can see that the blood loss over time and that total blood loss is much improved in the platelet-like particles, even compared to the regular platelets. So in summary, um, the um, platelet-like particles have come a really long way um, for um, the treating of bleeding, um, that they've done a lot of work with fibrin targeting and ultra low cross um, linked microgels um, to be able to do the work of the clotting and promote the clot retraction and really to make sure that um, that migration piece is able to happen. They've also been able to see that with different fibrin targeting strategies that they have better been able to get to that homostasis as a hemostasis. <laughs> Um, and also that um, the PLPs are not kept in circulation very long, so they're excreted within 48 hours, um, and that they've done these studies now in rats and pig studies, and that there is efficacy um, in the large animals as well now. So that was the first abstract. The second one is gene therapies to enhance the um, hemostatic function of platelets. Um, and so this was also very interesting because it was really about how can we use gene therapy to actually enhance and create more resilient platelets. And so the work here was really with risk um, with regards to using mRNA um, in lipid nanoparticles to, um, to deliver um, and modify um, nucleic acids and do trans um, transfection into the donor platelets. And the hypothesis here is that by having these lipid nanoparticles with the mRNA sequences, that you can have improved expression of the exogenous protein. So um, the lipid particles um, the, um, have several different parts to them. So they have the lipid on the outside, they have the hep helper lipids, cholesterol, and the pegylated lipids. And, um, and then um, you get the transfection of either the um, siRNA or the mRNA. And they, there's a large number of different um, um, bleeding related um, mRNA sequences that have been available and that they're working with. Um, and um, some of them were kind of presented at the ASH meeting this time. Um, and what they've seen is that the transfected platelets not only express um, the proteins as desired, but also that they maintain coagulability. And this was an example of one of the slides that they showed with regards to mRNA um, 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 coding that they did. And you can see that the clot stabilization that they were able to achieve afterwards is actually quite a lot better. Um, using these edited platelets in a rat model, um, they were also able to see that the blood loss um, ultimately achieved after the trauma um, was much better as well, um, and that they can see that the efficacy is there as well. And so one of the other things that was interesting in these ones is that um, the protein expression that they achieved was not necessarily um, uh, um, 
exactly related to exactly how much of an effect there was on the bleeding or of exactly how much of an effect there was on the ultimate hemostasis. But I think that these were interesting um, still lab and kind of um, animal-based models um, that really show what the future might be with respect to um, exogenous protein um, production within platelets and enhancing that and really makes you think about how can we improve kind of platelet activity um, but, and have improved transfusions um, by doing some of this um, protein engineering. The next abstract that I'll go to is um, really on the diagnosis of W um, of von Willebrand's disease. And the next two are a little bit of a call to action for all of us clinicians. And so the, um, I think we all know about the new guidelines on von Willebrand's disease that were released last year. They're really formed through panel formation, asking the clinical questions, synthesizing all of the information, and then the recommendations were made from there. And, um, and the links to the new guidelines are found on all of the or member organization websites. Um, this um, talk um, that um, that I attended um, by Dr. Valentino was really a call to action for people um, on several fronts. So the first is, is that there's a recognition that um, the burden of von Willebrand's disease is um, very large from a patient perspective and affects really all parts of their lives and throughout their lives. Um, and part of the work that we still need to do is making sure that this is recognized and that we're recognizing it on an individual level and also on a system level. And so part of it was about how can we validate the recommendations and how can we actually see that um, when we follow the recommendations that there's actually a difference in the lives of the patients and a difference in how perhaps we are working as systems as well. So how can we collect data and information on the lived experience with patients with von Willebrand's disease and how can we make sure we're systemically doing this as well? Another thing was about empowering um, healthcare practitioners. So not only hematologists, but really this was a lot more about kind of those eMERGE docs out there, those family doctors out there um, to make sure that they have the knowledge that, um, that they need um, on the diagnosis and the management of these patients to be able to be an important part uh, because those are kind of the frontline um, people that people with bleeding disorders are seeing. And a lot of it was also based on advocacy op opportunities. So as a system at the government level, but also at the, um, at the hospital levels and at the provincial, well, for them, this um, state's levels, about access to various medications like DDAVP, prophylaxis, surgical care, and genetic testing. And really one of the calls to action was really about working with our patients to be able to share the stories and to impact the decision makers on all of these areas. Another one of the biggest um, issues here was really about how do we activate the patient population? And how can we make sure that we're supporting um, patients um, and uh, patient groups through education, um, not only of the patients, but of other providers as well, and really collaborating with both our patients and other healthcare um, members to be able to, um, to do this. And so um, the big calls here were making sure that um, we're really talking about the um, bats and the self bats, um, that we're talking about paper, uh, patient empowerment and and we're helping improve knowledge of all of the members um, of these groups, but also of our other healthcare professionals as well. So that brings us to um, kind of the patient experience with von Willebrand's disease and the focus on women's. And um, there's several parts to this talk, um, but the one that I will focus on was by Dr. Scholzberg um, from Toronto. And um, I'd like to thank her for her slides as well. And so just some facts about people with von Willebrand's disease. So I think we all know that 95% of women with von Willebrand's disease will experience heavy um, menstrual bleeding, that there's a higher incidence of hysterectomy in this population as well, um, that their um, health-related quality of life is significantly affected, um, and that is much lower um, than in the general population. And really that um, when the studies have been done, that it's actually as low as it is in the severe um, hemophilia population who have HIV, which is quite significant. And a lot of this is um, seen in the teenagers as well, who have especially low health-related quality of life scores. And a lot of this may be because of school functioning and psychosocial help um, and um, how it affects their ability to be able to, um, to attend school, to be um, kind of not self-conscious during these years um, that are clearly important years during the teenage time. 
Um, so the other thing that was important to note that even in the patients who have von Willebrand's disease, um, generally it's something that's familiar. And so when they're talking to their family members, their bleeding is usually quite similar to other family members. Um, and so generations, not just individuals, become desensitized to what heavy bleeding actually means. In addition to that, there's um, there's a stigma still about talking about um, menses and to talk about um, bleeding in this way. And so even as healthcare practitioners, often we don't know, um, and especially if you're not a hematologist, you probably don't ask the questions in the best way. You probably ask things like, um, do you have heavy bleeding? And so if you, that's the way that you ask it, then people aren't going to give you the answers that you need. And then in, within the healthcare system, often if patients do bring it up, they're still dismissed or there's misrecognition of their symptoms. And that's an important feature that we've heard from our patients as well. And so um, the importance of using the bleeding assessment tools is um, so important. And um, using the validated BATS um, and adherence to using them on a regular basis is really important. And if you go outside of the bleeding disorders world, um, there's a lot of people who still don't even know that these exist. So um, one of the important things here was that the um, 2021 von Willebrand's guidelines really propose some really good um, good ways of asking about, um, about bleeding and um, of kind of defining a bit more what heavy menstrual bleeding actually is. So the greater than eight days, the soaking one, um, or, uh, kind of the one powder tampon every two hours or multiple days, um, use of more than one powder tampon at a time, um, having to get up to um, change during the night, uh, repeating um, passing of blood clots and the PBAC score of greater than 100. Um, so one of the other things that was very interesting from the series of talks was just that, um, is there a piece of structural sexism to exactly what is happening um, within the care of patients with von Willebrand's disease? Um, and this was really brought up in the context of iron deficiency anemia. So um, we know that iron deficiency anemia is clearly related to heavy menstrual bleeding and that, um, that um, low iron um, is going to make have effect on cognition, energy, um, health, and health-related quality of life. But then there is a uh, recognition that um, women actually have um, lower hemoglobins, but is that actually the way it should be? Or is it just because chronically over time, um, we have had women who have been iron deficient, who have been part of the studies that, that determine exactly what a normal hemoglobin should be in a woman? And so when we look at the actual data up until kind of the time of menstruation, um, the hemoglobins are fairly similar. And yes, we know that there's a role for testosterone, that testosterone will dry things up, but do we actually have good data on what, uh, um, on kind of what population-based hemoglobins would be um, if um, women weren't iron deficient? And so um, there is a really good discussion around that um, at the meeting. Um, in addition, iron deficiency anemia is really a public health equity and social justice issue because there is um, differences in exactly who we test and how we test and, um, and, um, and also access to kind of the foods that are higher in iron um, for various populations as well. And how do we best make sure that we're addressing some of the social injustices and the health inequality in these areas to make sure we're testing um, the populations that really needed and to make sure that we're educating and getting good access um, to food and, and uh, medications as well for this uh, population. So how can we best address this? So there's a lot of different things um, and a, a lot of different components to it. So there's access to care, there's education, um, there's um, um, preparation. Um, and the biggest thing is really working with the patients and working with our colleagues. Um, so there's a recognized need to, um, to actually use BATS. Um, we should work with populations um, and uh, communities uh, to, empower, um, to empower our patients. Um, that we really need to have multidisciplinary groups, um, not only for areas like um, hemophilia, um, when we're talking about bleeding disorders, but really for all of our bleeding disorders, patients management, and making sure that that multidisciplinary access is there for them as well. And then with, when it comes to iron deficiency anemia within the bleeding disorders population, it's really important to make sure that we're recognizing it and aggressively managing it as well. 
Um, and then collectively addressing the knowledge care gaps, both in women, in their families, um, in communities, and within our healthcare setting um, about what vulnerable brands is really all about. And then little by little, by doing this, that we should be able to address some of the um, structural sexism that exists within medicine, um, and that has been there over generations. And that the real way to do this is through um, the ways that we access clinical care and also research. And so this was just a nice picture um, from the Heme Equity Group. And I will hand things over to um, Ali. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ali Amid. I'm one of the, your pediatric hematologist colleagues. And thank you so much for having me in your, uh, in, in your presentation. First time I'm attending Thrombosis Canada presentation. And um, as a pediatric hematologist and after Dr. Sino's presentation, I thought that I merged the bleeding and thrombosis together. And then at the end, I, I, uh, I conclude our presentation with a pediatric um, uh, thrombosis uh, study. Uh, Okay, perfect. Uh, so I don't have any uh, conflict of interest to report. And um, uh, the first uh, study that I will present, uh, it is on hemorrhagic and thrombotic uh, adverse events associated with emicizumab and extended half-life factor eight replacement products in patients with hemophilia A. And this is a study from Europe using a Euro vigilance, uh, uh, Eurodot vigilance database. And as we all, where uh, over the past two decades, there has been really a, a lot of improvement in bioengineering and understanding of the uh, hemostasis and thrombosis in uh, in human. And with that, much a lot of new products are coming to market. Among those are either non-factor replacement treatments or extended half-life products. Together, uh, they actually have probably a great improvement in patients' quality of life, uh, easier mode of uh, administration, and uh, improvement in clinical outcome as well. But with that, as we know, uh, thrombosis is relatively uncommon in uh, hemophilia. And I say relatively, definitely we see thrombosis in patients with hemophilia. But when I say relatively, it is relative to general population, I should say. Um, but as we are improving our care for patients with hemophilia, there is this perception that we're going to increase the complications that are associated with a normal hemostasis probably in the future. One of those would be the thrombosis. And uh, one thing that the studies do, of course, they will report the, the, the adverse events, uh, but usually the adverse events, especially the rare adverse events, are reported in just a small number of studies. And uh, pharmaceutical uh, companies, they have a surveillance program but this is not long term, so uh, so real life data are are really important for us to have. Uh, so Eudro Vigilance is a system that they they track the adverse events reports that they get from uh, post marketing phase of the of the of of, uh, of the approved uh, products. And here in this study, the investigators. Uh, they, they looked at the Eudra Vigilance database using the post-marketing data for hemorrhagic and thrombotic adverse events for non-factor replacement and also extended half-life products. And um, it is interesting because this is the best that they could come up. The reason is that this is just a database of adverse events and uh, really the, the the denominator of the how many patients were exposed and how many how much the adverse events were not there it is it was not available to them so what they do they came up with these ideas of um, proportional reported ratio which is the number of each individual adverse events of interest compared to general adverse of in interest in all, as well as this reporting odds ratio, which is the proportion of adverse events in between different groups of the patients that are uh, uh, kind of uh, exposed to different products. They, they try to use it as the best next next best uh, measure to compare. And what they 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 did see that on the top is the bleeding complications, and on the low is the thrombosis complication. And what they have seen is that. In their database, over one year in 2011, there were 24 thrombosis cases were reported. And interestingly, most of them were arterial thrombosis for the emicizumab and for extended half-life, the almost same pattern, but less often. 
when they looked at the bleeding pattern, they saw that proportionately uh, having bleeding was less in a mesizumab compared to extended half-life products, but also the thrombosis was proportionately higher in um, in uh, emesizumab compared to extended half-life product. Having said that, because we don't have the denominator, this is, this is you know, I think this is the best way that you can look at it, but definitely is not an accurate measure. So they concluded that uh, they, they could see a signal towards more thrombosis, but less bleeding in emesizumab compared to the extended half-life products. And uh, like most of the other studies, they, they suggested that the further cohort studies are required. And uh, this highlights the, the importance of uh, pharmacovigilance in the post-marketing phase. I don't go through the uh, appraisal. So the next study, uh, I thought that I finish with a study that sh shows you more question than any answer. And this is our life in pediatrics that we have very little, little data to rely on. And we always borrow what we have from adults, uh, but there's huge differences in between adults, thrombotic, thrombotic events, and also the pathophysiology and hemostasis in general. <clears throat> So this is a uh, study from Israel that they looked at the pediatric splanchnic vein thrombosis uh, as a systematic review of meta-analysis. And what they wanted to do is that they wanted to see what is the pattern of that uh, thrombosis is and what is the effect of anticoagulation. <clears throat> so, so in pediatrics, splanchnic vein thrombosis are exceedingly rare. Um, and they may be associated with long-term morbidity and rarely mortality. And, uh, and really there is no uh, high quality data is available uh, for in children, how to manage these and what is the pattern and etiology of this, uh, uh, this thrombosis in, in children. <clears throat> So, so as we said, they wanted to see what's the pattern of it is, and also whether the anticoagulation was safe or ef effective in this in this children and adolescents. They looked, uh, uh, they reviewed the, all the published articles in Medline and Embase up until December 2021, and they used only the data of the studies that reported the outcome, both thrombosis and and bleeding outcome. <clears throat> And also they looked at the uh, pooled analysis uh, uh, of the of the outcome uh, using anticoagulation versus not. So they summarized 508 patients and compared to your studies that each one of your studies randomized trial, you have 500,000 patients. Uh, and most of them, uh, around two thirds of them were portal vein thrombosis and the second group at Budkiari syndrome, I was surprised that they didn't find a lot of splenic vein thrombosis and mesenteric vein thrombosis. And it is just because we probably don't report them once we have one case here and there. <clears throat> and and uh, as you can see, around one third of the patients were anticoagulated and two thirds they were not anticoagulated. <clears throat> here is uh, the proportion of response to anticoagulation and without anticoagulation, they did a smart thing that they didn't compare them together because this study, uh, it, it was such a bias towards who reports and who to treat. Uh, so I think it was it was false that they report which one is better, but, but you can see that with or without anticoagulation, uh, between 40 to 60% of the patients had resolution of, uh, of of their clot. Uh, in terms of the bleeding perspective, they they didn't see a lot of differences. Um, patient who received anticoagulation, they had slightly like around 4% versus less than 1% in those who didn't receive anticoagulation. But when you look at the non-major bleeding, there were more non-major bleeding in uh, patients who did not receive anticoagulation. This suggests that they, there was a selection bias for patients to, uh, to undergo anticoagulation if they were at the higher risk of bleeding to begin with. Uh, and in terms of mortality, there was not any significant difference in between them. And when they looked at the any recurrence of uh, thrombosis, very low recurrence, and all of those they had it, they were actually on anticoagulation already. Uh, so, so basically the conclusion of this study was that the, regardless whether you anticoagulate or not, 
uh, there is a high rate of recanalization and uh, and there is a low risk of bleeding and the thrombosis progression uh, in pediatrics. And this is something that we see with also other patients uh, that we treat. Uh, we hardly ever see any major bleeding in pediatrics where we decide to anticoagulate them. <clears throat> and I want to go through this and thank you so much. Importantly, please hold the date for this wonderful meeting that is coming up in October. Vascular 2023 will be a large meeting of multiple organizations involved in the vascular care, care of patients with vascular diseases. So um, we all look forward to seeing you there in October in Montreal, which is a great city. And uh, thanks so much for um, supporting us and the delivery of our programs. Um, we are a charitable organization. Please think about us when um, it comes time for uh, donating any amount helps, you know, even something small helps to support our uh, academic mission to bring you education um, and resources for, for practitioners and patients. So thanks so much for uh, your attention and participation. On behalf of all of us, 